Iron Man Extremis. A storyline that has been reused multiple times in various incarnations of Iron Man, be it the movies, the animated series, and other ideas in general. But what you don't realize is that Iron Man Extremis is actually a six-issue storyline and a single volume. So today we're going to be bringing you that six-issue storyline, that volume of Iron Man, Iron Man Extremis, for you to enjoy and see where it actually started. This story was written by Warren Ellis around 2006, and it eventually leads to the Civil War storyline. And you have found yourself a comic historian. This is one of our full story videos where I just bring you everything involved in the storyline related to our title. This allows you to know what's going on in the world of comic books, and when you go to your local comic book store, you know what to add to your collection. So to set up Iron Man Extremis, at this point, Iron Man is still using a giant clunky suit of armor. He's not using anything else. As you'll see in this storyline, he's going to learn a better way to use his Iron Man armor. It was the middle of the night when three men walked into an old abandoned slaughterhouse in Bastrop, Texas. The first man took out a small syringe and asked the other, Malin, if he's sure about this. Malin tells him to do it, and while the second man holds Malin in place, the first takes the syringe, injecting something into the back of his neck. After a few moments, Malin shouts in pain, falling to his knees, and then nothing. The two men stare for a bit, stating that they might have been sold a dud. They should just go back to... Suddenly, Malin gets up coughing, and his eyes turn bloodshot as he begins to vomit up black sludge. While Malin withers in agony, the two run out, locking him in and leave. It's only a couple of days later that Tony Stark wakes up in his garage, hearing his phone going off. He grabs it, answering, asking who is it, and the woman on the other end says that it's Mrs. Rennie. She's his personal secretary. Does he really not know? He groans, sitting up. No. And Rennie tells him that it's time to come out of that disgusting garage and greet the world. He had an interview with Pillager at 10 a.m., and it's currently 8. Tony gets up stating that he hates her so much right now that he can taste... Okay. Have fresh clothes and coffee sent down to the garage, maybe an IV drip. After finally getting to the bathroom for a shower, Tony looks at himself in the mirror and stares. He asks himself what is he even staring at, and after a few moments, he turns. I hate it when you look at me like that. Meanwhile, in Austin, Texas, Dr. Aldrich Killian of Future Farm sits at his desk listening to some of the staff handle calls about their most recent break-in. Their vault was compromised and several of their special projects have been taken, most notably, Extremis. Killian types away at his computer, writing an email stating that Maya Henson was in here earlier shouting at him. She always shouts. It's only a matter of time before the thief is discovered and interrogated. He won't go through another interrogation. He knows he lost something terrible. Knowing that it had to be done, it doesn't ease the burden. All the emails are on this machine, and if they can find them, he can do that much. But understand, this had to be done. He's beginning to shake. It's becoming harder to type. After hitting print, Dr. Killian opens up his drawer, takes out a gun, and holds it to his head before pulling the trigger. Maya comes running over after hearing the bang and sees what Dr. Killian has done. She takes the piece of paper that's been printed and hurries back out. One of the other doctors asks what happened. She says that they need the paramedics or the police or something. Dr. Killian shot himself. He shot himself in the head and it was him. He stole the extremist dose. This paper is his confession. After his interview, Tony goes back to the garage, pressing a button only he can open with a micro trip embedded in his arm. And suddenly the metal doors rush open. He looks at the Iron Man suit in shock that it used to fit in his briefcase. After suiting up, he rockets into the sky and laughing, free from the world and its views of him. But while floating up in the clouds, he gets a call from his assistant stating that it's Maya Hansen, and she wants to speak to him. But later that night back at Bastrop, the two men who left Malin return to see the door has been nearly punched open. They go inside and look to see Malin all huddled up, shivering, eyes and teeth stained red. As they get closer, Malin looks up and tells them that he's alive. Later, Tony is pulling up to the Future Farm offices, and Maya runs out hugging him, stating that she walked right into his office, and he was... He stole her project and gave it to someone, and they don't know who. Tony tells her to relax, show him to the office. He enters and sees the computer, asking if the police have been by. She says that they have, but they're sending another team to pick that up. They can't break the security. Tony copies the hard drive, and says that it's gonna take Marco a bit to get through it. How about we go see Sal? He's still in the Bay Area, right? So they take the jet and they head outside of a home in the woods. Maya says that it seems that Sal is on his woods kick again. Tony says at least it's better than his minimalistic raw foodist phase. 
As Tony rings the doorbell, Sal opens it up. My children, come on in, come on in. Should I twist you up a bomber? The two tell him that they don't touch the stuff anymore, and Sal laughs, stating that his children have become weenie straight people. Oh, the horror. While talking, Maya gets a call about an emergency, so Tony takes out his phone, turning on the news to see the Houston-based FBI office in flames, and a reporter explaining that it would appear that this is all caused by a single, unarmed man. He supposedly breathed fire. Some said that they could even see a ripple of gas coming out of his throat, and then he came back, and things came out of his hands. Maya watches, stating that the signatures, the fire, the hands, and a few other things, an extremist enhanced did this. Whoever stole the extremist dose took it and lived. So Tony calls his assistant, stating to bring the limo around, to prep the plane for an immediate return to Austin, and tell Mrs. Rennie that he needs his car flown to Austin on the sister plane immediately. It's in the crate. Back over in Houston, Malin gets into the back of the van, and the men from before ask, what the hell did he do? He smiles. What did I do? I'm just getting started. Later on Tony's private plane, he asks how sure is she about this, and Maya tells him, aside from the clear signatures and the computer analysis on the video report that her staff performed, it happened within driving distance from them, inside of a couple of days of a successful extremist installation period. Tony sits up. This extremis, it's about time you told me what this is. Extremis is a super soldier solution. It's a bioelectronics package fitted into a few billion graphic nanotubes and suspended in a carrier fluid. A magic bullet, like the original super soldier serum, all in a single injection. It hacks the body's repair center, the part of the brain that keeps the complete blueprint of the human body. When you're injured, we refer to that area of the brain in order to heal properly. Extremis rewrites the repair center. In the first stage, the entire body essentially becomes an open wound. A normal human blueprint is then being replaced with the Extremis blueprint. The brain is being told that the body is wrong. Extremis protocol dictates that the subject be put on life support and intravenously fed nutrients at this point. For the next two to three days, the subject remains unconscious within a cocoon of scabs. It's all pretty gross, as you can imagine. Extremis uses the nutrients and body mass to build new organs, better ones. They're loaded with everything that you could think of. The hypothetical that we were given was to build a three-man team who could take Fallujah on their own. Tony sits back. So someone took this and survived? What a mess. At that moment, his phone rings and he answers it. And after a moment, he asks, Really? Excellent. Great. How are you dinner? After hanging up, he says that that was his guy, hacked the dead boss's files. He gave Extremis to a group of militiamen local to them. Domestic terrorists. He needs to make some calls. Once the plane lands, Tony says that the car will take her back to Future Farm. He's gonna go help launch Iron Man into the field so he'll catch up with her later. He heads over into the private hangar where there's only one box, and he opens it with the microchip in his arm. The shutter pulls back, showing the Iron Man suit, and Tony says, all right, just need to get into this without anyone looking at me and them not seeing me naked. So a short while later, two men ask Malin if he's okay. Malin looks up in the van, telling them that he's fine, just fine. But high above, Tony is scanning the truck to see three passengers, telling the police that he'll be engaging with repulsor weapons. These are reactionless force projections, one-way pushes. Get in the way of one and you're risking broken bones and eternal organ damage. All police should stay clear while I attempt to free the two in the front from their target. He focuses on the middle of the moving van and cuts it in half, letting the two men up front drive ahead while Malin flips and crashes with the back half of the van. Tony holds out his hand, telling Malin, Get on the ground with your hands behind your back and ankles crossed. There's no reason that this has to be difficult. But Malin looks back. Yes, there is! Lots of reasons! Tony hits Malin with the repulsors, but seeing it do nothing, he increases the power. Malin ducks to avoid being hit again and charges forward, breathing fire on the suit. Tony grabs him by the mouth to stop him, but then small barbs stick out of Malin's fingers and they grab Tony's arm, sending electricity throughout the entire suit. With Tony paralyzed, Malin picks him up, throwing him back towards the highway, landing right on top of a car, causing the cars behind it to crash. Another car doesn't break in time, ramping up the back onto another with a massive explosion. As the fire spreads, Malin jumps back onto the highway, but Tony releases a sonic screamer, stunning Malin long enough to throw a punch. 
As the screamers then stop, Malin catches the punch, gripping into Tony's fist. They go back and forth for control until Malin finally punches Tony's chest, nearly disabling the suit in one blow. Tony stumbles back while his systems try to catch up, but Malin turns back, picking up a car, holding it over Tony's head. Malin laughs, <laughs> you're gonna burst inside of your suit when this hits. They're gonna have to pour you out, Iron Man. But before he could slam the car down, Iron Man hits him with a chest repulsor that knocks him away while catching the car. The suit's onboard computer then pings, stating the power transmission is at 0%. Just as Tony tells it not to, the suit releases the pressure and the car falls on top of him. Malin slams into the road a bit away, but as he gets up, he sees the police are now closing in. He says that it doesn't matter. He has all the time in the world now. He begins to run away and Tony lays there crushed under the car. When the police are able to secure the area, an officer asks, who are they supposed to call for him? Stark? The Avengers? And Tony, while still in the suit, tells them, I, uh, already spoke with Stark. Use one of those choppers and airlift me to Future Farm. Try not to hit too many bumps, I'm bleeding internally, and scrubbing blood out of this thing is a nightmare. A short while later, Tony is carted into the Future Farm, and he whispers to Maya to get rid of the others. She tells the other doctors to leave him as she secures the room, asking if Tony sent him there. Tony tells it, yeah, he did. One of the items is a briefcase. Can you bring that back? While gone, Tony sits up, connecting his helmet to the computer, and begins to go through the feed from the fight. Inside the van, when it was cut in half, there was a map inside with directions to Washington, D.C. At that moment, Maya returns and hands over a large briefcase, asking what is it? And Tony tells her that it's an experimental suit. He's been trying to get the Iron Man back to a collapsible model for years. This model is made out of memory metals. An electrical charge makes them snap into shape, and the molecular structure then turns into a super hard plane. It's tougher, faster, and lighter than the current suit. He couldn't miniaturize the control systems yet, so he needed the undersheath, the hard upper torso, and the helmet systems. After being hooked up, Maya says, that he still cannot do this. Call the Avengers, but Tony tells her, no, this is my fight to finish, Maya. She waits for a moment before activating the machine. And then we see what Tony is planning, what the whole point of miniaturizing his system was and what he thinks he's going to do to fix it because the extremis is injected into Tony's body. He begins to twist and contort, and then he begins to spit up the black goo like Malin did, and then nothing. Maya patiently waits as Tony's body begins to move into the cocoon face, and beneath it, his shattered bones begin to align themselves. She leans in, asking if he can hear her, and with no answer, she sighs. Damn him for trying this. This isn't how it's supposed to be. At that moment, the scabs begin to glow and melt away, leaving Tony healed on the table. He blinks. I'm alive. Well, I'll be damned. How long was I out? She begins to examine him, telling him 24 hours, but this was way too fast. He says, yeah, he made some alterations to the program while she was out. He removed some safeties. So how about they see how all this stuff that he grew works? He looks at some of the small holes across his body and he says, start. Maya asks, what did he do? And he laughs, <laughs> this. Suddenly small gold pallets start to scale out from the openings on his body. He says that these are super compressed and stored in the hollows of his bones. He carries the crucial undersheath of the Iron Man suit inside of his body. It wires directly into his brain, and he can control the Iron Man with thought, like it was another limb. He then looks at the briefcase, and it pops open, and the pieces start to assemble themselves as she asks how he's doing that. He tells her, vectored repulsor field, just lightly pushing stuff from different angles. Once fitted, she says, my god, we have to run tests. We have to make sure your organs are okay but he begins to walk out in his new extremist suit. No need, I got new ones. It's time to go stop Malin. Just inside of DC, Malin begins to walk through the alleyways when he is suddenly struck from behind by a repulsor blast. On the ground, tiny pellets are being shot and exploded while Malin tries to shield himself. He looks up to see Tony floating down, telling him to lay on the ground with his hands behind his head and ankles crossed. Or I'm just gonna have to kill you. Then you're gonna have to kill me then, Iron Man! I've been given a tool to save people like me from those criminals in the White House. Tony picks up a car throwing it, using his chest repulsor to cut into the gas tank and let it explode. This pours fire onto Malin. As Malin tries to put himself out, Tony then walks forward, punching Malin into the wall, and then kicks him in the face to put him down. 
He focuses his repulsors on him, telling him, You're just a murder-happy hillbilly who never in his life had a thought about what these tools are for. Okay, you gotta shut up, Iron Man! And Malin fires a beam that Tony shifts behind him. I'm not there anymore. Got an upgrade. I'm just as fast as you now. After being knocked back down, Malin tries breathing fire, but Tony scans the ground, blasting a hole, grabbing an electrical cable, and slamming it into Malin's chest, launching it through a building. Before Malin could even get up, Tony is already there, punching him through the walls, into the next room, and eventually out the other side. Malin catches himself on a crane hook, but as he rips it off, he begins to swing it above his head. Tony rips the shovel off of a bulldozer, asking, Do you really want this? I'm trying very hard not to kill you. Malin whips the chain around as Tony blocks it with the shovel and then bashes it across Malin's head. The two go back and forth, punching each other until Malin screams, tackling Tony to the ground. He begins to focus all of his energy into his hands to crush Tony's neck. Tony tells him, For God's sakes, don't make me! There isn't going to be any future! You're going to kill it! At that moment, Tony's chest repulsor fires a hole through Malin's chest. And while he's stunned, he grabs Malin's head, turning the repulsors to full blast, and there's an explosion, and Malin's headless body slumps over. The body begins to try and get up, but then falls back down. Tony gets up, kicking it. Damn you! Damn you for making me do that! But there's one more thing. The worst thing. Later at Future Farm, Tony tells Maya that it takes two keys to open up the Extremis vault. Her boss had one, and she had one. He couldn't get into the vault to steal Extremis, on his own. She drops her books, and Tony goes on. I had some time to do some thinking, and my new suit wires me into all kinds of networks. I know. The army pulled the extremist funding. No field tests, no more money, even though you had a working process. So you and your boss decided to arrange a live demonstration, dose a terrorist with extremists, then call your friend Tony Stark who employs Iron Man. As the Extremis Enhanced are tested against a man wearing the most advanced personal combat system on Earth, Maya asks, You know what they said about the atomic bomb? They said it had to be used once in anger, in order for it never to be used in anger again. I would have used the renewed funding to get out of the arms race, to set up my own medical technology. The only mistake that I made was giving a damn about who was inside of the Iron Man suit. There's no difference between us. You're no better than me, Tony. Tony pauses for a moment. Maybe, but I'm trying to be. And I'm going to be able to look myself in the mirror come tomorrow. And there you have it. I know it seems kind of short that this is the extremist storyline that everyone uses for movies and animated series, and they reference it all the time. But what actually happened is extremists stuck around for quite some time in the comic books. Just looking over the wiki real quick to see notable moments that actually involve the Extremis suit directly, in the Stark disassembled storyline, he erased portions of his memory in order to prevent Norman Osborn from gaining access to the list of people registered under the Superhuman Registration Act, which was the whole plot of Civil War. In 2012 is a storyline known as Believe, in which Tony Stark basically learns that other versions of Extremis were released in the wild. Then, one of my personal favorite, in Original Sin, they tried to use the Extremis virus to kind of, like, fix Bruce Banner's brain, and it kind of created this weird, super-intelligent Hulk, more intelligent than we had before. This went all the way until 2014 with the Axis storyline, where he kind of got turned to evil Tony Stark in general, and then used Extremis as a drug. He basically sent it out into the city and charged people $100 a day to use Extremis, and Extremis would make you feel incredible. That was the entire point of the drug. That's known as Superior Iron Man. Now, all the storylines I just read to you, if you want me to read those as well as full stories, just the entire storyline in one big video, then give us a like, give us a subscribe, and let me know in the comments down below, because we are looking for more Iron Man full stories to bring to you guys right here at the channel. I really appreciate all of your support throughout the years, and I'll see you next time right here at Comic Storium.